Good morning. Good to see you all here this morning. It is 11 o'clock, so we will go ahead and start our worship service. We have a few announcements. First, and well, not foremost, but certainly importantly, I want to thank everyone who was involved in coming over yesterday evening and uh, uh, cleaning up and undecorating and things that were done. I sincerely appreciate you all doing that. Taking care of it so faithfully and quietly. Um, it's a real service uh, not only to this congregation but to God. And, uh, it's nothing less than that. Uh, also wanted to share with you very quickly a, uh, a letter from the McKim Center. Um, they said it is a great comfort to me, this is from Dwight Warren, the executive director. It says, it's a great comfort to me and those who work at the McKim's Community Center to know that our work is appreciated. What we try to do for the children is made possible by those who support our projects. Without such selfless support, McKim could not exist. As we celebrate the holiday, we recall the many gifts that we have received in the past years, and we give thanks for the friends such as you. It is through your generous support that we have been able to serve the needs of the children of our community, and they convey, and the Kim Center conveys to our congregation um, deep appreciation for the generous gifts of Christmas toys for the children and their families. And we hope that each and every one of you will be blessed by the new year with all good things in life. And that's from Dwight Warren, the Executive Director of McKenna Center. So thank you all. Thank you all very much for your support for that. We've also been, uh, well, part of us have been invited. Um, there's uh, a men's dinner uh, that I think happens every month at, um, it's not at, but it's with the men of the Mount Hebron, uh, or Hebron Presbyterian Church that we have some partnership with. Um, Adrian Pratt, their minister, and I did uh, John's, uh, John Lawson's funeral here recently. So Adrian wanted me to extend the invitation um, to you all for the men's dinner that they're going to be having at 7 o'clock on January the 24th. That's a Wednesday evening. So if you could let me know, they, I think he said they have about seven or eight guys that, that show up. So it's not a big crowd. And uh, they would really appreciate doing it with us. So if any of the men of the church would like to um, get together with their men of the church on on the 24th of January at 7 o'clock, just let me know by Monday the 21st, um, either by email or, or in person. Um, and then I can tell them how many are coming and, and we can get a table. It will probably be at the White Oak Tower um, in Ellicott City, so, which has great hamburgers. Um, that's a good thing. They also have craft beer, but I'm not supposed to be talking about that up here. <laughs> so, just let me know um, by, the, by Monday the 21st. And let's see, also in your bulletin, um, we have a session meeting tomorrow night um, because there was too much ice the last time, and it'll be at 7.30 tomorrow night. Uh, this week coming up is uh, the Lifeline Screening. It'll be on Tuesday. Um, you can read about the details in your bulletin, but uh, that's a great service to have here at the church. Also, uh, Life Touch Picture Directory, our, our picture directory for the church. The photographs will be shot on um, Wednesday and Thursday of this week, the 17th and 18th. If you have any questions, or certainly if you have not scheduled yet, please get in touch with Naomi Ball and make sure that you um, get a time that you can uh, have your picture taken for this directory. Also want to let everybody know that on February the 18th, that Sunday, we'll be having our third annual um, Super Chili Bowl cook-off. So that'll be fun. The details again are in the bulletin. And also to remind you that the flower chart is um, out in the narthex uh, on the bulletin board. So if you'd like to donate flowers, one 
on Sunday in honor or in memory of someone, please sign up. So, do we have any other announcements besides that? There's going to be a congregational meeting on the, what is it, the 28th? Yes. Um, I'm going to be out this next week um, after tomorrow um, because of a continuing education event that I'm required to do each year. Uh, so I'll miss you all, but I will not be in town until um, next weekend I get back and uh, Lorraine will be preaching next Sunday, so you have that to look forward to. But um, that's why we're not having it on the third Sunday, which is the usual time. So we moved it to the last Sunday. So the congregational meeting will be on the 28th. And is there, there's a coffee? A is there a pot pot to follow, right? Like a pot love, everybody can pot to follow the congregational meeting. Okay. And a short sermon, okay? So that's something, <laughs> something to put on the calendar too. Short sermon, congregational meeting, pot love. Anything else? All right. Well, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And may the peace of Christ be with each and every one of you. And also
call to worship. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. I'm coming before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us. Meetings for that, I hate them. You've worn me out. 
I'm sick of your religion, 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 while you go right on sinning. When you put on your next prayer performance, I'll be looking the other way. No matter how long or loud or often you pray, I will not be listening. And you do not, and do you know why? Because you've been tearing people to pieces and your hands are bloody. Go home and wash up. Clean up your act. Sweep your lives, your lives clean of your evil doings so I do not have to look at them any longer. Say no to wrong. Learn to do good. Work for justice. Help the down and out. Stand up for the homeless. Go to bed for the defenseless. This is the word of the Lord.
Sermon on the Mount. This is the concluding paragraph in the Sermon on the Mount. Everyone then who hears these words of mine, Jesus is saying this, who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was its fall. This is the word of the Lord. Raise your hand if you have heard of Clarence Jordan, or as many people um, refer to him, and he referred to himself as Clarence Jordan. Okay, well good, then it is my privilege this morning, and I was hoping that this would be true, it's my privilege to introduce you to Clarence Jordan. He was a fellow that grew up down in Georgia, down in the southern part of Georgia. He was born and raised in, in the rural part of southern Georgia on a farm. And when he became old enough to go to college, he decided he wanted to continue his education and uh, learn more about farming and got a bachelor's degree in architecture. I mean in agriculture, excuse me. And um, he felt like he knew as much as he wanted to know about farming, but he was a very strong Christian who decided that he wanted to learn more about Christianity. So with no intention of becoming a preacher, he went to the Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville after he received his degree in agriculture and got a seminary degree. And while he was at Louisville, at that Southern Baptist Seminary, he became so deeply interested in New Testament Greek that he decided that he really wanted to be able to be an expert in Greek and be able to read the Bible in the original language for himself and not to have to rely on interpreters and scholars. And so he went on and got a PhD in New Testament Greek. Very educated farm boy. When he got done with his degree in New Testament Greek, he had this vision that he would take all of his agricultural knowledge, all of his farming experience and knowledge, and he would combine it with his understanding of the New Testament and the teachings of Jesus Christ, and he would start a community. And this community he wanted to call koinonia, which is the Greek word for community or fellowship or communion, and he wanted to use the best of farming methods of the time for this community, but he wanted to combine them with those very early concepts of Christianity that we find in the book of Acts. Even so far in this communal living situation to share your common wealth. It's very radical, but it came right out of the book of Acts in the New Testament. He also didn't want there to be, and this was in southern Georgia, remember, he did not want there to be any barriers based on color or ethnicity. So African Americans were just as welcome as Native Americans, as Asian Americans, as Caucasians. Everybody had a place at the table at Koinonia. Now today, that might not seem so radical, but we're talking about 1942, when Clarence Jordan founded this farm, this community that he called Koinonia. And in 1942, in rural Georgia, this was pretty unheard of. And everybody thought Clarence was crazy and didn't really 
didn't really have a problem with him until the mid-50s when the civil rights movement began. And the deeper we got into the civil rights movement, the more Clarence went from crazy, being viewed as crazy, to being viewed as dangerous. And he became quite a figure, a, a, a lesser known figure, but an important figure of the civil rights movement. He later translated the Greek New Testament into the modern vernacular of the time and with, with a real bent on the civil rights interpretation to a version of the Bible called the Cotton Patch Gospels. Has anybody heard of that? The Cotton Patch Gospels. It was later made into a play that uh, is still performed to this very day. It's a... Um, it's just a really good telling uh, of, the, of the New Testament that kind of brings it to life in a way and makes it very relevant in that, you know, instead of Jerusalem, Clarence put in Atlanta. Instead of the Pharisees, Clarence called them the Southern Baptists. So, so it made it real, and it also made a lot of people mad, but Clarence was pretty used to that by then. But all of this attention that Clarence was getting with his... With his uh, community koinonia with his translation of the scriptures, the Cotton Patch Gospels, all of this made him a very popular speaker. And there was up north of Atlanta a very large Baptist church who had just built a brand new sanctuary. And they were going to have the dedication um, on Sunday morning and they had asked Clarence Jordan to come and speak to them for this dedication. He was to be the, the headline speaker and draw a big crowd and this was really going to be a celebration when they dedicated this brand new great big sanctuary. Well, Clarence agreed to do it and it was a beautiful spring morning and it was a time at which Clarence, uh, for a very brief time, uh, had purchased a motorcycle and was enjoying riding his motorcycle when he would go around. And it was a perfect morning for a motorcycle ride. So he put on his leathers, put his preaching robe and his Bible and his notes for his sermon in the saddlebags and, and decided he would take an early morning ride up to this, up to this big Baptist church to dedicate the building. And he got there before anybody else was there. And so he got off his motorcycle, parked it over in the edge of the parking lot, and sat down on the front steps just to enjoy the morning. And he hadn't been there very long when a couple of older men who were clearly the deacons of the church came and they were going to unlock the front door. And Clarence was sitting over to the edge of the steps, leaning up against one of these big white Corinthian pillars that so often are in front of uh, Southern Baptist churches. And, and he started to speak to them. He started to get up and speak to them. And he saw the look on their face. And it was a scowl. And it was judgmental. And it was disdainful. And they didn't say a word to him just unlocked the church door and went on in. Well, Clarence thought about that for a minute. He decided what he would do is just sit there and see how the rest of the congregation reacted to him as he came in. Remember, he, he had ridden, you know, he was dusty and kind of rough from his motorcycle ride. He still had his leathers on. Didn't look too respectable at that point in time. And so, one by one, the congregants came and all of them, without exception, had pretty much the same reaction as the first two deacons. Most of them didn't even look at Clarence, but those that did, did so with judgment and condescending in their look. And not a soul, not one single person in that church spoke to him, much less invited him in for the service. Well, Clarence just watched him. And so it came time to start the service, and Clarence went out to his motorcycle and got his robe and his Bible and his notes for his lesson, his sermon, out of the saddlebags. 
And he went in on the side door and he met the preacher who had invited him to come speak that morning. And he put on his robe and he walked out with the preacher and there was an audible gasp from the congregation when everybody recognized who he was. This rough looking character that had been sitting on the front steps of the church. Well, the service went on, and it was a nice service. It was good singing, a full choir, a new organ, all for this dedication of this beautiful church building, this sanctuary. And the time came for Clarence to give the sermon. And he stepped up into the pulpit, and he looked out on the congregation, and then, then he closed the Bible, and he stepped down to the center aisle. And he continued to look at every single member of that big congregation. And finally, he said in a voice that not one single person, no matter how hard of hearing, could have missed. He said, well, y'all got a mighty nice building here. It's a beautiful building, but it ain't no church. That he walked down the center aisle, went out, climbed aboard his motorcycle, and drove back to Koinonia. Probably the best sermon he could have preached for that congregation that morning. It's a beautiful building, but it ain't no church. Another person affiliated with Koinonia and Clarence Jordan is a fellow by the name of Miller Fuller. More people may have heard of him, as you will see in just a minute. Miller was a young man. He was a very successful businessman. This was in the early 60s. He had accumulated quite a fortune, and he and his wife Linda should have been happy as they could be. They had everything that money could buy. They were young, they had their health, they had a big house, they had an apartment, a very nice apartment right off of uh, Central Park in New York City, in Manhattan. And yet, neither one of them was happy. Their marriage was on the rocks. Miller was spending all his time trying to make money. And they got to a point that their marriage was getting ready to crash and burn. And Miller said, look, Linda, I'm going to go up to our apartment in New York. You stay here. And uh, I'm going to go up there and think about what we need to do. Well, they were both Christians, and Miller thought, and he prayed, and he read Scripture, and he came to a very radical decision, a very radical decision. He came to the conclusion that what was really hurting their marriage and his life was that he was putting too much emphasis on money. And so he decided to flat out give it away. He had millions and millions of dollars. And this was in the early 1960s, and that meant something, to have millions and millions of dollars. And he gave it away. He invited Linda to come up. They talked about it. They agreed as a couple to give their money away. That that was the solution. That was the start to a new life. So they just got in their car and they decided to drive back down to their home, which was in Georgia. And they had heard about this fellow named Clarence Jordan. They were looking for answers. They were looking for the answer to what do we do now, okay? We've divested ourselves of all our wealth. We want to give our lives to the service of God. What do we do? How do we do this? And they had heard of Clarence Jordan and they had heard of Koinonia and they decided that they would stop by. Their idea was, we got to go fairly near. It's not too far out of the way. We'll stop by for a couple of hours, meet this fellow, spend an hour or two talking to him if he'll let us, and then we'll be on our way. Maybe he's got some answers. Well, the two hours turned into two weeks that they stayed at Koinonia. And a friendship, deep, deep bonded friendship began between Millard Fuller and Clarence Jordan during that two weeks. And after they had resettled at their home, Miller decided he was going to come back up and spend some more time with Clarence. And one of the ideas that Clarence was playing with at the 
time was he wanted, he noticed that some of the people involved in Koinonia's community did not have enough money for their own house. And remember, part of Clarence's idea about Koinonia was his shared property, shared wealth. Probably wish Miller had met him a little bit earlier. But <laughs> Clarence had this idea, why don't we as a community build houses for people in the community that can't afford them and <clears throat> we'll give them, we won't just give it to them, but we'll give them these houses with no interest loans that they can afford. We'll make sure that they put sweat equity into it and, and we'll do this as a community, but it'll be their home when they're finished. But they've got to help build it, you know, they, and they've got to uh, take the loan on it. It just won't will be a no interest loan and the terms that they can afford. Well, Miller heard this and he immediately snapped up this idea and he said, why does this have to be contained to the Koinonia community? Why can't this be spread everywhere? And Clarence said, well, it can. I just don't have the time to go out and, and develop it and market it outside this community. I've got my hands full here. And Miller said, well, I'll do it. And we'll call it Habitat for Humanity. For humanity. And that was the birth. Right there with Clarence Jordan and Miller Fulham, that was the birth of Habitat for Humanity, a worldwide housing program that has done unbelievable good. Well, as you can imagine, as, as Miller began to build these houses around, he was often asked to the dedication of these houses. And there was one particular dedication early on in Habitat's history that Miller had gone to and um, it, was, it was a lovely family. Sally was uh, this tiny little African-American woman, had a couple of kids um, and she was raising by herself and could not, she was working full time, but she couldn't afford the houses that were for sale. And so Miller's Habitat for Humanity had built this house. She uh, driven many of the nails herself and helped daughters had helped as well, and now they were getting the keys to their house. It was the dedication, and, and Miller made this very, very nice speech, and, and there was a little crowd there that was celebrating everything, and, and just at the end of Miller's speech, before they handed the keys to Sally, Sally came up to the microphone, and she said, she said, Mr. Miller, may I please say something before you give me those keys? And he said, sure, sure, Sally. And so she stepped in front of that microphone, this tiny little woman. And, and it was on the front porch of this house that was minutes away from being hers and her daughter's. And she had these big tears running down her cheeks. And she put her hand on the doorway, put it up against that house she had helped build. And she said, Mr. Miller, Mr. Miller, you need to know this is the gospel with skin on it. This is the gospel with skin on it. A dedication of a church that was not a church. A dedication of a house that was the gospel with skin on it. And isn't that the choice we all have? It's as simple as that. Friends, I'm not fussing at you. I'm not judging you. I'm not saying anything except what I would say to myself, which is we have a choice. We can look like Christians or we can be Christians. We can look like a church or we can be a church. We can build our house on rock or we can build our house on sand. It's up to us and it's a question every single one of us, including myself, especially myself, need to ask every day. Amen. <laughs>
in standing for the departed. Uh, unfortunately, Pep Martin died just before I was gone, and so it didn't happen that Sunday. And then with the epiphany and the end of Christmas, um, it slipped through the cracks last Sunday. So this Sunday, this Sunday, it seemed very appropriate to me um, that we all stand and have a moment of silence for the celebration of the life of Pep Martin, all the ways in which he touched our hearts and brought joy to this congregation, and celebration of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in whose arms he now resides. Let us have a moment of silence for Pep. Let us go to God in prayer. Lord, we come to you this morning in humble gratitude. We are grateful first and foremost that we can come to you at all. That you, creator of the universe, all that is seen and unseen, almighty God, all-knowing and all-powerful, that you, you are willing even desiring to lean down to us in grace and love, laying your ear against our hearts to listen to our greatest joys and sorrows, our deepest pain and loftiest dreams. All our dreams you know so well. And yet we know that you also have dreams, O oh Lord. You have a dream that the lion will lay down with the lamb. And all of nature will someday be restored to its Eden perfection, to be tended and enjoyed by all and for all the peoples of the world. You have a dream that nations of every size and color and ideology will someday lay down their weapons and embrace in peace, will beat their swords into plowshares, and reach out to one another with open hands instead of closed fists. That we will turn the other cheek not to receive an angry blow, but a holy kiss of reconciliation. You have a dream that someday your law will be written indelibly on our hearts and your word will live so fully in our very being that our knowledge will be complete. You have a dream that faith will be blotted out by knowing, that hope will be realized by fulfillment, that we will know you as we are known by you, and love will abide, Lord. Love will abide. Our only prayer today is that your dream becomes our dream. We ask these prayers in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught his own disciples when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 